Hi, my name is David Bowes. I am the Communications and Marketing Director for Washington Policy Center, and this is Washington Policy on the Go, our weekly series, well, weekly during the legislative session and then every other week outside of the legislative session where we update you on what our center directors um, are working on, uh, what the legislature is up to, um, and we take a look at, at uh, good and bad policy proposals and the impacts uh, of those policies, uh, what they're likely to be in the future. Now, today it's pretty packed. We've got three center directors with us. Uh, we'll speak first with Mark Harmsworth. He is the uh, Center for Small Business Director. Then we'll speak with Pam Lewison, our Center for Agriculture Director. And then we'll close up with Jason Mercier about not only the income tax ruling, but there's already fallout uh, to the income tax on capital gains ruling. Washington State stands alone in the world, as Jason pointed out, uh, in defining an, a, a tax based on income as an excise tax. And because it's now it got this label that does not involve income tax, advocates can avoid the political fallout of advocating for an income tax. What other things is that ruling inspiring? Um, you'll see and hear about that uh, coming up a bit later on in the program. Uh, I want to remind you some of the ground rules. We'll have uh, we'll talk with each center director for about 10 minutes or so, maybe 15, depending. And then if you have any questions during that period of time, just enter them, whatever it pops into your head, into the Q&A box there at the bottom of your screen. We will um, we'll get to those questions with the center directors. I'll incorporate the, them into the conversation. We do try and get all your questions answered. Um, sometimes uh, we'll share your comments. I can't guarantee every comment will be shared, but <laughs> especially if it's a bit more profane, which does happen from time to time. But I do try and share some of those comments as well. So if you want to do that, you're welcome to. Uh, just use the Q&A function instead of the chat function, if you would, because it's easier for me as a moderator to go through there and uh, be able to utilize those and, and track them uh, for you. So let's first start with Mark Harmsworth. He is our Center for Small Business uh, Director. Mark, um, as always, it's great to have you on the program. You were a three-week repeat uh, earlier after a long dry spell. Uh, now you're just just kind of back in action all over the place. Let's start with the legislature. They've passed uh, a House Bill 1050 that passed, and you say it's going to increase the cost of government construction projects. What is uh, House Bill 1050? What does it do, and why is it going to increase uh, costs? Well, uh, thanks for having me on, Dave. Um, the bottom line is uh, this is just a power grab by the uh, labor unions. Um, a lot of uh, public contracts go out for bid, as um, you, I'm sure everyone's aware, and uh, you get to bid on the contract. Sometimes they have a, a an amount that's put on the contract, so you kind of know where ballpark where you're at. If you build a little bridge in town or fix the road, fix some potholes, um, you know you you bid for this uh, for this work. House Bill 1050 has put a 15% apprenticeship requirement on the workforce of the company that would win that bid. So if you're an open shop and maybe you've got 10 employees and you can still bid on a million dollar contract, which is the, the, the minimum required on this, uh, on this bill, um, there's no way that you can have 15% of your employees be apprenticeships. Uh, you know, apprenticeships are a great way for folks to, to learn a new trade, although there's some caveats, which I'm sure we're going to talk about here a little bit later. But uh, basically, this bill, 1050, is muscling out all of the open shops, except for the very big ones, for the yeah, bid on this and making sure that all public contracts now are being bid on and will the successful bids will be uh, union shops at the end of the day. So uh, basically, it, it, this reminds me of, uh, you know, the, the classic, well, it excludes some of the bigger shops for now because they've got a lot of uh, lobbying muscle and, and loud voices. But if I were them, I would be paying attention because, um, you know, there, there's a certain there's a certain ideology that reminds me of the Borg from Star Trek, uh, the next generation, you know, resistance is futile <laughs> and, and they might accept this little caveat now. But um, I don't think that uh, that 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 uh, set aside would be long for the future if I was going to predict the future of policy uh, suggestions in Washington state. Right. I think you're right, Lacutus. Um, the <laughs> uh, the other thing that I want to mention here, too, is the uh, Washington State Apprenticeship Council. Uh, this is a body that um, approves the training programs for apprenticeship. So these very apprentices that we have in this 15% requirement 
um, in order to become one of those apprentices and get through the training program, think um, electricians, when you go through that whole journeyman process to become a, a master electrician, um, the board that oversees that is also run by the labor unions. They have the majority vote on that board. And um, the board is open to new bodies coming in and offering certification programs, but the certification program is so arduous to get yourself in a position where you can offer these uh, training sessions to people so they can become electricians and so forth, trained um, uh, trained workers. Um, it, the last one that came through CITC, it took 20 years. And in fact, with the IBEW and the CITC are the only two on this body, pretty much makes the apprenticeship programs themselves union controlled as well. And um, there was an effort uh, to expand out of the traditional construction industry into about 20 different job segments over the last two years, including information technology, healthcare, to create these new apprenticeship programs to muscle down on who can actually apply for these jobs in the first place which is, again, another push by the unions to, to take over. It's, it strikes me that, um, you know, this, this strikes me as a bit of, an, of a workaround uh, regarding Janus rights, where people, uh, you know, the Supreme Court's mm -hmm. ruled that you have a First Amendment right not to join a public union. Now, we're talking about private industry, so it's private, it might be private unions, but it's still government now trying to enforce Mm -hmm. uh, via other means, union membership. So it's still a it's a workaround to try to to try to deny uh, these rights to to other people. Um, yeah. So but, to to be part of the winning contract, you have to be an approved apprenticeship. Uh, I've gone through approved apprenticeship, and that apprenticeship is being run by the very union that's bidding on the contract. So they can choose if you decide not to join the union because you don't have to, um, then. Uh, you're not going to get the opportunity to work on these projects. So uh, it, it's uh, a very, uh, it's an end around to get around Janus, as you, as you called out there. And I, and I think, um, you know, in our constitution, you have the right to organize. And so we have to have a playing field that works for, for everybody. And in this particular bill, 1050 is really limiting it down to just uh, labor unions. What's the next step for this bill? Uh, this bill is uh, going to the governor's desk for signature, so it will become state law later this year. If he doesn't veto it, Mark, I mean, come on. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> this is I mean, not one of those he's going to veto, though, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> if he does, it's. I, yeah. I'd check the calendars. Like, what, is it, April 1st is passed, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a sad thing, I think, bad policy. Um, I want to uh, focus, turn to your blog about Seattle, which gives us a little bit of a win. Um, something positive to talk about. Uh, you posted a blog about the Seattle law that prevented rental property owners from running criminal background checks. What's happened with it? Well, the um, Ninth District Court struck down the lower court, uh, which would be the Washington Supreme Court, um, uh, their decision to ban the ability for um, property owners, landlords, and, and rental property you know, providers. Uh, they were not allowed to do a background check. Uh, on folks. So they struck that provision down. So that that's a great thing. You now get to find out who's going to be living in your house uh, and some of their criminal background. It was under the guise that um, uh, everyone has everyone has the right to find someone to live. And the point is, um, yeah, that's true, but or at least they have the ability to go find someone to live. But you need to know what the risks are. You can't put a, a, a sex offender, no matter what level it is, in, in a duplex with kids next door. So um, uh, just uh, uh, the very fact now that you can check that, it doesn't mean you won't necessarily rent it, but it also protects that landlord from liability as well. So this was a good, this was a good move. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, it's the same thing for theft or, or other things. You know, if you've got somebody who's got a, a record, you're adding risk to your property and you should be aware of that. I mean, you, a lot of people have their retirement invested in that or uh, mm -hmm. savings. You know, maybe they're counting on it to put their kids through college or take care of themselves when they're older. But there seems to be this attitude that people who have properties that are renting are like, you know, Scrooge McDuck or something. And they just, they just want to just squeeze every dime out of uh, all the people that are just helpless before their, their cruelty and greed, instead of, you know, uh, people just like you and me trying to make the most of life and, and prepare for things. So mm -hmm. um, that's a little piece of good news. In yeah, the meantime, 
Spokane provided us good news a couple of weeks ago in terms of reversing course on their, what was it, 2,600% increase in, in costs and fees for certain kinds of housing uh, permitting yeah. or so. Yeah, so Spokane, uh, they, um, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks back, but they added a uh, a twenty six hundred percent increase in the connection fee for waters into commercial and large residential properties like apartments, and um, due to the uh, public outrage, not just in Spokane but statewide, including some of the things that we've put out, they've taken a pause on that, and they're not going to do that now until possibly next year when everyone's not looking. So we have to stay vigilant, um, at least for now. They've made some changes, but they've realized that that was a galactically stupid move on their part. I like the reference to galactically stupid. It does strike me as as such on this. Uh, but they're you know they're right back in your blog focus because you know once again, <laughs> um, they're the, uh, they're bringing back the lime scooters, which seem to have they were super popular for a moment in time, and then they just kind of faded away. In, in in a heap, much like the scooters themselves that you'd see on the side of the road or right. in, in the bushes, blackberries around urban centers. Uh, Spokane's back at it. Why? What? Um, what? Well, if, uh, if I knew that, you'd be a wise man, or maybe even a rich man. Uh, so uh, as many folks know, uh, a lot of cities are, are um, playing with scooters in their downtown cores under the guise of this is going to be great for the environment. This reduces pollution. People can now ride their scooters to work in Seattle. That's great. I mean, you know, you, they're pretty ma maneuverable on the sidewalk and you're trying to miss all the needles. But the the, the, the whole point is it's supposed to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Well, when you actually look at the raw numbers, and this is something that uh, our own Mr. Myers would very much appreciate. Uh, a scooter isn't actually the panacea that they try to tell us it is. The carbon output for creating these scooters in the first place, depending on the life of the scooter, um, can be or can be more than a, a family car for the same period of time. As an example, which sounds ludicrous, but when you actually start looking at the amount of energy you have to put in to build the batteries and then go pick these things up, and everyone's seen these things in the ditches and abandoned on the side of the road, and the scooter companies have to go back, pick them up in a truck, take them back to the facility, and often repair them. You know, the, the whole fiscal uh, concept of these scooters to make money was to have them on the streets for about two years before they need to repair. Well, it turns out it takes about 60 days before they get trashed and they have to get fixed. So Spokane had uh, Lime scooters. They had about 293 as of the end of March this year. Uh, Lime is back with a new model, which is supposed to be better, faster, safer. And uh, I'm assuming it's going to be flying at some point here in the future. But um, this thing's going to solve all the problems, which it really won't solve the problems. If they were just honest to say, look, we just want to tear around downtown on our scooters and have a good time, that would be fine. But when they start pushing it as this environmental um, benefit, it's it's baloney. And, and on top of that, they're also using the right of way, which is a taxpayer funded, um, obviously, an access point uh, on your city there. And they're letting these companies use it for free. And so they're profiting on taxpayer dollars. And again, that's, that's wrong. So they just need to be honest about what these things are. And we'll see what happens in uh, Spokane. All the other cities have failed in their uh, in their endeavors. Yeah, I'm going to go on a limb right now and predict that Spokane will suffer a similar fate. One of the things that you pointed out in your blog, though, was the mo that, that oftentimes when they're talking about the environmental benefit, they don't account for the kind of modes of transportation that the scooters are actually replacing. So instead, you know, they're talking as though, hey, this scooter is replacing an SUV or a Hummer or something, you know, but it's it's really replacing something else. Go yeah, I haven't seen anyone go shopping at Safeway on a scooter yet and try to bring those bags home. They're being they're basically replacing um, man powered bicycles, so you know, regular bicycles and walking. And so when you if you take the car and the bus out of the equation, they are not very good for the environment at all. Yeah, it's it's a great blog. And I thought it was a great point for those scooters because so often you, you just see this kind of, you know, green halo around them as an experiment without consideration of what it takes to build them or their lifespans. You point out, but their lifespan in California was two weeks, you know, in yeah, some yeah. places. So, yeah. you know, two weeks for a sc scooter is, that's uh that is not the normal lifespan of, of a scooter. I yeah, they're not treated well when they're on yeah. the street. 
who would have thought that uh, a common good would not be treated well? You know, you, mm. you might even think there'd be a tragedy um, of, of the commons there. Well, and, and I did put a blog out just a couple of months ago on some of the fatalities that we've seen because they're, uh, they're being used. And in Seattle, they've even banned or they've even removed the requirements for helmets now. So you're getting scooter users on the street close to large vehicles, trucks and, and other cars. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a matter of time. And people have been hurt. There, there is a part of me, though, that thinks of all the things that people are doing to their bodies in downtown Seattle right now, you know, the, the added risk of the helmet might <laughs> might be the least of the problems. Um, sad well, to say. It, it's probably running over a needle, having a blowout and then crashing your scooter. Yeah, it's just tragic. All right, Mark, thanks so much for making the time again today. Uh, appreciate it. Great blogs, by the way. Really interesting uh, material. Let's move to uh, Pam Lewison. She is our Center for Agriculture Director. Pam had a new column in the Tri-City Journal of Business talking about the um, the impact of the new income tax on capital gains, now called an excise tax in Washington state, but an excise tax based on income, which one would think by definition would be an income tax, but not with our creative wordsmithing in the Washington State Supreme Court. So, um, Pam, you wrote about what uh, kinds of uh, impacts this might have in the uh, agri agricultural community and far for farmers and ranchers. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, you know, a lot of the plaintiffs, I think actually all of the plaintiffs in the income tax case were farmers uh, for a reason. And uh, it largely, I think, stems from looking at agriculture and farmland in particular and the sale of farmland um, as a source of retirement. Uh, you know, I think people forget that um, farmers don't have necessarily a whole lot of liquid assets. You know, a lot of your assets come from your land or uh, equipment that you happen to own. And um, it's really easy to hit that $250,000 um, threshold for taxes at 7% um, when you start selling uh, farmland. And for a lot of folks, uh, the average age of farmers in Washington is 59. Uh, you know, they're, they're looking at some hard choices. Um, it's not easy to sell your land, but if your choice is sell your land so that you can um, you know, retire and, and be comfortable um, versus working forever. Uh, most, uh, most farmers, I think, are making some of those um, difficult decisions or at least talking about it. Yeah, and, and you know, there's an added thing, which is already we've seen uh, efforts to try to change this tax from 7% to 9%. So if I'm a farmer and I'm approaching the age where I want to retire and you know, I'm not going to be able to pass the farm on to somebody else. I'm going to have to, I'm not going to be able to sell it. So I'm going to have to sell the land um, as my asset because, I, I, you know, on paper, I've got a lot of money, but I don't have cash money. I have assets. And so, which includes, by the way, farming equipment, which isn't going to do you any good if you're not a farmer. So if suddenly you're looking at, you know, instead of 7%, 9%, you know, coming down, even if it doesn't pass this year, you know which direction it's going so I would expect that that one of the um, unexpected consequence of this would be uh, people making those decisions earlier, you know, because these fees add up just like life is added up in these little moments, um, you know, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4 you, know, you add them all, all up and uh, those increases, and they start to add up to, you know, lo and behold, real money that, that you're not going to be able to use for that retirement plan. I had an interesting interaction with somebody yesterday on Twitter um, about, about, you know, why this is such a big deal for farmers in particular, because things like 401ks get taxed as well. And they, and they do on a federal level. Um, but the trouble with it is that farmers don't have a 401k. Their land is a 401k. So um, they're automatically in a higher tax bracket with this new income tax. Uh, and in addition to that, you also are assessed the um, real estate excise tax, the REIT, uh, at a graduated rate too. So um, you're getting sort of double taxed uh, just so that you can uh, potentially retire. Uh, your other option is to figure out some way to <laughs> circumvent the law which none of us want to do. I don't think anyone volunteers to, 
to break the law. Um, but your other option is to figure out some way to skirt it so that you're selling pieces off right under that $250,000 limit until it's all gone. Um, so, you know, I think the the real issue that I have with it is, is uh, lawmakers who are proponents of this tax have said over and over again that it's only the ultra wealthy. They're the only people who are going to be taxed um, in this scenario. And that's just not true. Farmers are not ultra wealthy people, and yet they are the people who are paying for this tax. Well, I mean, just, you know, I know, I know that there's some exemptions for now, uh, but there's already been moves to change the threshold from 250,000 to 25,000. Uh, I think Jason uh, talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but, um, you know, so that could change o over time, but also just real estate prices in general, you know, my first house was was uh, what I think two hundred thousand dollars, and the last time I saw it appraised, it was six hundred and seventy thousand dollars. No, I don't own it anymore, and yes, I wish I did. But um, it's uh, it, you know people can can make a lot of money from this from the sale of real estate, and then all that enables them to do is go buy a house somewhere because the prices are so high. Well, I so, think that's you know that's something else to consider too is that a uh, great many farmers live on their farm. So um, while in Western Washington, some farmland is sold for more than a million dollars an acre, um, you run into two kind of ideological problems with that. One, uh, people do have to find somewhere else to live, uh, but also we have this overarching discussion about how we want to preserve farmland and we want to make sure that we are still a state that produces food, but we are hemming in uh, you know, our food producers in such a way that they feel as though they have no choice in some cases, but to sell that land, not even just for retirement, but to get away from other things. And as a result, that farmland is being purchased by developers who are taking it out of production and turning it into uh, you know, a parking lot or a mini mall or a house. They are not using it for food production. Yeah, it's something people don't, don't consider um, when, they, when there's opportunity costs and trade-offs. And you know, it's, a, it's a sad thing when you start pushing farmers out, that means something else is gonna be there, right? It's not just gonna be wild, you know, a wilderness there, it's gonna be something else. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know that that uh, you know residential properties are currently exempt, but I also know there's a slice by slice uh, approach to taxes like this, especially because of the volatility, where there's there's going to be commitments made by the revenue. The revenue is going to be very volatile. It's not going to do what people hope to do, which is you know collect ever more every single year, and then they're going to try to find new ways to, to collect the revenue. And uh, the most popular for income taxes like this is to expand the base, you know, so that you make more money. Um, I think, you know, I think we can all agree that uh, that in the long term, that's that's the prediction to bet on. Um, oh, well, one more thing before I let you go, Pam, um, and a, a good column, by the way, in the uh, in the Tri-City Herald. You can read it on our website, WashingtonPolicy.org, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, you also wrote about something that we talked about on, on the show. Um, gosh, I think it was uh, last year, but you have a new, new uh, post. Congress votes to stay WOTUS rules until SCOTUS rules, which is always fun. Um, WOTUS being uh, the waters of the United States. Um, tell us what, what's the scoop with the waters of the United States ruling and, and what happened with it and why we should care. So uh, the White House and the EPA uh, near the end or near the beginning of this year, excuse me, uh, enacted new rules for water waters of the U.S. Um, this is something that I think is pretty hasty considering um, the Supreme Court is in the middle of deliberations on a ruling that may guide um, the waters of the US in a pretty significant way. Uh, in that um, case in particular, a couple in North Idaho has been trying to build a house uh, across the street from a lake for 20 years. And uh, the EPA says they can't because uh, their land is a wetland. Um, but there is no visible water on this piece of property. And so um, it's 
really about you know what what constitutes a navigable waterway, what constitutes waters of the U.S., and how do we um, define those regulatory authorities? Right now, uh, the White House and the EPA are in the process of of enacting and rolling out these new rules, these new enforcement rules, despite uh, the fact that they may have to change them. Um, you know, the Supreme Court is supposed to rule uh, in the next few months on uh, the waters of the US. And so um, Congress uh, passed uh, a House joint resolution, which is effectively a piece of paper that says, we disagree with what you're doing. Um, the president has to sign it. He's not going to. He's already indicated that um, he'll veto it when it comes across his desk. But what it does say is that Congress agrees that it's too soon to start implementing rules on the waters of the U.S. when we have a landmark case that is being deliberated by the Supreme Court. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating to see this kind of, of huge policy shifts done by administrative authority when they're using an extremely broad and, and creative way of quote unquote interpreting you know, that authority. And we've, we've seen it in other areas as well, you know, where people want a law to apply to you know, other circumstances uh, because it might be uh, popular amongst their base or whatever to do so now. But you know, the language and the intent is, is pretty clear. And so uh, that's a frustrating thing. You'll, I take it you'll continue to watch, you know, watch the court uh, court action on that and wait for a decision. Yes, I, you know, I do think what's interesting about it at this juncture is uh, you have a lot of people who are really invested in waters of the U.S. policy. Well, this is a big deal, especially if you're in a rural environment, and the the way that the rules are laid out right now everything from an ephemeral stream, which is something that comes and goes seasonally, would be considered waters of the US. That's a, a, a wildly broad definition of waters of the US that could potentially impact um, you know, farmers' ability to water in their fields if uh, the EPA wanted to say that your irrigation ditch is an ephemeral stream. So, um, having such a broad focus for enforcement on this particular issue um, is really problematic. And it would be nice to see it shift back to something where we are preserving um, the true intent of the Clean Water Act, which was you know, to make sure that we're not polluting as a nation into our freshwater system, but also understand that that doesn't have to mean um, that no one can ever have anything to do with impacting our water sources. Yeah, I remember I, I knew some some folks who had property and they, they built a little pond, you know, to get ducks and things in there and give them a place to rest because of increasing urban environment and this type of thing. And, you know, and then the more they see things like this happen and where suddenly they're not allowed to use property, there's big, huge set-asides, they're not going to be able to sell, people bulldoze that stuff over and, you know, they don't, they just, they they bury it and, and pretend it never existed. Um, you know, they built it themselves. So, uh, and then, you know, I had another friend who had a, you know, it was, it was clearly a drainage ditch in a hayfield and, and uh, he had the, just a horrible time, you know, fighting against this uh, attempt to call it a stream, um, you know, same kind of, of, of issues there. So, you know, these have unintended, well, maybe they're intended consequences, but they're spillover effects of, of these do-gooder policies that don't actually fit with the reality of, of, uh, of living and trying to uh, conserve resources with, you know, when, when it's on your property and you're, when you're in a rural environment. The cities don't have to worry about it, even though they've paved over it. <laughs> All the streams, you know, they're, they're just going through a dark sewer somewhere. So uh, there's that. Uh, Pam, we got a, one quick question for you. Does the new income tax apply to people who have their homes on a large plot of land? And is it considered uh, agriculture for property taxes because they sell hay once a year? Uh, so the way that this new tax works, it really depends on whether or not you're selling uh, that piece of property and how much you're getting for it. Uh, you know, hay income once a year 
is a, a different kennel of fish. Um, and I, you know, the USDA defines being a commercial farmer as having $2,500 gross income from the sale of an agricultural product. So there's, um, you know, there's a lot more to unpack there, but unless that land is, is actively being sold, uh, it shouldn't matter at this juncture. Uh, but again, you know, that's, that's always subject to change as we have seen with our lawmakers already floating ways to change it. Heidi, you may have given them the idea. So <laughs> just for asking the question, you, you might inspire somebody to change, change that for the future. Um, just joking. Pam, thanks so much for making the time uh, and appreciate the work that you did there on the on agriculture and for Washington Policy Center. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. All right, let's turn to Jason Mercier. Uh, Jason is uh, pretty much the, the guru when it comes to the income tax on capital gains. Yes, I'm still calling it that, but now it's the excise tax based on income. That's not an income tax because we're not calling it that. Um, that's uh, basically a summary of the state Supreme Court decision and uh, and what Washington, why Washington State is is the confusion capital of the world when it comes to economics over the past month. And uh, Jason is here now to talk about uh, some of the aftermath of this ruling and what it is inspiring in the legislature. Jason, thanks for making the time. What what are you seeing now in the legislature when it comes to other tax proposals that are kind of piggybacking on this approach from the state Supreme Court? Yeah, thanks, Dave. You know, if you give a mouse an excise tax cookie, he's going to want a broader income tax to go with his milk, right? And I thought we were going to have at least until next year before the legislature started to take advantage of Washington state discovering the very first excise tax on income on the planet. But uh, I was wrong. We already had a bill proposed yesterday that would impose an excise tax on what they call excess compensation. Now, just let's just stop for a moment and think about how disturbing it is for the government to say that your compensation might be excess, notwithstanding whatever employment agreement you've reached, contract you've reached, decision you've made about why you're going to engage in a certain activity. We've got this bill now that is going to impose an excise tax on what they deem to be excess compensation, right now targeted just to certain hospital employees. But why stop there, right? Once you go down this road, what other excise tax are on income are you going to think of next? So we couldn't even get two weeks past this ruling before they started to test the, the waters here. And this is probably just the first of many of these type of bills we'll see going forward. But it's just not at the state level. We're also starting to hear rumblings, whether it's Seattle or other cities, that you know cities have excise, excise tax authority. Now, the Supreme Court has said that this is an excise tax. So you're starting to hear some council members in the city council of Seattle thinking, well, we should impose an excise tax on capital gains for those that live in Seattle. And there was actually an amendment when this bill was being considered back in 2021, it was a Republican amendment by Senator Linda Wilson that would have preempted local capital gains taxes. So, you know what, let's not Let's not compound this problem that we're doing with throwing away the state of Washington's competitiveness. Let's not add local capital gains taxes as well. And that preemption amendment failed. So really at this point with the Supreme Court ruling, this is a valid excise tax and knowing that cities have excise tax authority, it's not if there's going to be local capital gains taxes, it's when. And the question is which, which uh, city with the um, progressive label will get there first? You know, my money's on either Bellingham, Seattle, or or Tacoma, <laughs> just as as far as the race goes. I'd, I'd bet on Seattle, but uh, you never know. Some things slow them down from time to time. So, um, and, and Dave, it's, I mean, the, the only thing that's unclear right now is because our court has made the determination that this is an excise tax, it's not can a city do this? It's just a matter of do they have existing authority, right? Because local governments, are creatures of the state. They have to be given a grant of approval to tax. I'm just not clear right now if they can shoehorn that approval into an existing tax authority or they need explicit approval. But I can bet you right now, so the attorneys are looking at that question. Well, and, and let's say you're a private company and you're looking at this going, well, I'm not so sure that that authority applied to this kind of tax. Based on uh, the uh, Etch-a-Sketch um, ruling of the state Supreme Court, where very, very clear language on 
you know, th this is a, t a tax based on income. By definition, therefore, an, an income tax. Laws are generally not meant to be so confusing that that uh, that no layperson can understand them. But in this case, they're calling it this this excise tax. You know, you know, if you're a private company, is this is this where you want to spend your legal battle in the city trying to fight fight this kind of thing and see it march its way toward the same Supreme Court that um, discovered a tax um, of that a tax based on income is an excise tax, unlike anywhere else in the world. I mean, is that where you'd want to spend your money? I mean, I, I can't imagine it. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I mean, there obviously are still those who will want to test the, the legal waters here. But I mean, after what the court did, twisting the plain meaning of words, creating a, a new tax out of nothing, I, I'm not sure you're going to get a better outcome from this current right. court. So I think, we're, unfortunately, you're going to see a lot of attention turning as not do we fight this in court, uh, do we call our realtor and relocate? There's a question from Mark. He asks, will the Department of Revenue release the revenue received after this first filing year? Yeah, actually, I was kicking around that question myself about whether or not I should do a records request here in a, in a couple of months, because we know the tax is due on April 18th. It will be disclosed because it's going to be part of the revenue collections, and we do have another revenue forecast coming out in June. So the short answer is yes, that, that amount collected will be publicly available, not the amount per taxpayer. And uh, Steve is asking, what's the bill number of the new uh, health excess compensation excise tax? Um, I did a blog on it, so it is on our website. If I'm going off my memory, I think it was 5767. You know, I, I had this up on my screen here earlier, so I'll, I'll put it in the chat here in just a second for folks. But, you know, um, what about the real estate excise tax, the REIT taxes? Um, is there any movement on that? Uh, Jason, based on the, the ruling from the, the state Supreme Court. Well, so, you know, we talked last week about my concern about them transitioning. That That is a true excise tax, right? It's a, it's a flat percentage based upon your sale price. So what I was speculating last week under this ruling that you can now have excise tax on income, maybe they start tweaking that based upon your, your gain and not just the sale price. I haven't seen that, but unfortunately, there was a Democratic Presser this morning from legislative leadership and the House Democratic lawmakers, and this was the phrase they used, there is great enthusiasm to move a tax increase on the real estate excise tax this session. So I think it'll be more of a traditional rate, but again, in their own words, they have great enthusiasm for this tax increase. Yeah, there's, and keep in mind, I think every time we talk about the tax increases that are happening, we need to remind everybody about what position the state has been in, right? Where, you know, over the past, what is it, 12, is it 12 or 15 years, we've increased by 150% in terms of, of revenue, um, you know, the, as, in, as far as tax dollars that are collected, and this is the budget of, of the state now, we had a 20% bump, this current, uh, this current biennium in terms of spending, Right. So when they say we're have a we have a, a slower growth this next time of what what was it you said two point five percent for this next biennium? Well, actually, it's, it's not that low. It's about eight <laughs> percent. I thought that was the next one after after that. But yeah, I mean, it's just there's just one big cash wave after another coming toward them, and yet you know this message comes through, and and one of the things I, I saw an editorial in the Seattle Times, you know, all excited about this po the possibility of of the new excise tax based on income. And you know, one of the things that that uh, the, the columnist said was that the state, you know, people aren't afraid of higher tax rates, but they're just happy to have a very efficient government and a beautiful environment in Washington state. And the first thing I thought of in, in all the infrastructure that comes with that efficient, uh, efficient government, and the first thing I thought of was, well, We've had a backlog on infrastructure for highways, roads, and bridges, where they're called, you know, they're called dangerous. There's the schools that are still trying to get earthquake, you know, retrofitting uh, there. The the roads kind of speak for themselves. Ever since the, you know, since Christine Gregoire was was running, you know, the the backlog on maintenance on roads and highways has been a big deal. And this is despite these tens of billions of dollars, you know, pouring into the the state as far as spending goes. Um, and then, you know, Todd Myers has pointed out we haven't met a single one of our climate um, objectives. So this this notion that, you know, if, if only we had a little bit more revenue, then this efficient government will magically appear and our environment will be taken care of. 
and these things that the government has been starving, uh, been starved from taking care of, will, will suddenly, you know, will suddenly uh, be fixed. I, I think that is uh, wishful thinking at its very best. There. Yeah, and before I get to that point, Dave, I, I I confuse the Senate budget increase with the revenue. So the Senate budget increases eight percent. The revenue, you're right, it was lower, around three percent. Well, I was basing my comment on your numbers, so, so, so you know you you might have been wrong there, but you were right through my voice. So either way, yeah. Well, everything you know, everything I know is because of of you guys. So you know, to to your point there about you know we just we just need more money, and uh, I think that that's the concern now with what the court has ruled because I can tell you in the budgets right now that are in various. I think the House and the Senate have both passed their versions. They'll go into a conference committee here as we get closer to signing die. But there is a study. It's almost a million dollars to study bringing Washington a wealth tax, right? So that's in the budget right now. We went through this multi-year effort of what they called the, the Washington State Tax Structure Working Group. And if you recall, this working group said no income tax, no wealth tax, right? Well, this budget reauthorizes that to start this process all over again to see if maybe they can get a different recommendation now in light of the Supreme Court's opening the door here to excise taxes on income. So this, this tax fight, despite the fact that we are continuing to see our, our revenues increase, it is coming in full force in the coming years. And I always wonder when I see something like this, you know, who's collecting the money on this thing? Because as you point out, there'll be a study coming out. It doesn't have the result that they want. So they just launch a new one. And, you know, the, the the state sinking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars into this kind of nonsense. And when, you know, you could also take a look at what other states have done. You know, you're not starting in some black hole. Um, you know, legislators can take a look at other states and see if it's possible. So that, but they act like there's some, you know, some need for <laughs> some scientific crew to go figure out if this tax will work or not. You know, if you want it, just just have the guts to say, you want to quit wasting money ahead of time and go for it and see what the people uh, have to think about it. Um, yeah, there's a question here from Stephen. He's, we, I know we've, we've answered this before in previous weeks, but is there any avenue for appeal to federal courts regarding the Commerce Clause or something along those lines on the yeah, so, I mean, uh, income tax on capital gains? The challenge with this is this is obviously clearly an income tax. And that's why it doesn't run into problems in other states, because you can be taxed based upon being a resident of the state, regardless of where your income is earned. What you can't do underneath the Commerce Clause is tax ex activities in other states. And if, in fact, when our court rule is correct, that this is an excise tax, a, a tax on activities, then it would violate the Commerce Clause. So the question is, and when this goes to federal court, uh, what, what, are the, what are they going to look at? The, the fact that Washington alone calls this an excise tax or Everybody else in the world calls it an income tax. So it is a vehicle. You may see a challenge, uh, but it's it's one that I think most people would say is, is a Hail Mary. We are hearing multiple conversations around a possible ballot measure. It's just unclear at this point what that will be. Is it just a straight repeal? Does it try to ban other types of excise taxes on income? Uh, so that, that's a conversation that we'll have to see how that unfolds over the coming months. And just a reminder for everybody, the um, last time the state sales tax was cut was 1982. So 40 years ago, a little over, <laughs> there was a cut to the state sales tax rate, even though we're at record high spending right now. So when you hear about the the uh, heightened concern level for fairness and taxation and how there's a, a burden on the poor, the Washington Policy Center has advocated a cut to the state sales tax rate for quite a while now. We've had all kinds of opportunities to do so. The legislative majorities were asked, you know, Jason blogged about this um, at the beginning of the session, were, were asked about uh, this, and there's just re been refusal after refusal after refusal. So it's not about making life easier for some, it's about an ideological obsession with, with taxing um, certain people, and uh, which ends up punishing, you know, you, you get less of what you tax, right? So you're, you're punishing innovation, you're promise, punishing people for coming here and creating. So sad thing. Jason, um, as always, uh, any uh, final words, anything you want to want to share or anything that surprised you so far in the aftermath you want to share before we before we cut it off for today? Let me do something very unusual for this session. Let me share some good news. Right. There was actually. I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> yes. By all means, I even had that on there. But I. I Come on, Dave. I let me I, let me do something positive once. I know time. I spun myself down into this uh, this abyss. Yes. By all means, share the good news. There was some good. 
So there was a court ruling last Friday in Thurston County Superior Court, and it was brought by this brand new public interest law firm in the state of Washington. It's called the Citizen Action Defense Fund. If you're not familiar with them, I encourage you to take a look. They challenged the fact that the governor's budget office, the Office of Financial Management, would not release the original offers that were exchanged between the governors and state employee unions on the pay raises. And this was actually a records request that I made. And I was told I can't have those details until after the budget is passed by the legislature and the governor signs it. Uh, but TADF, led by their executive director, uh, Jackson Maynard, said that's not right. That should be a public record. And they sued. And last week they won. The Thurston County Superior Court said, yes, these are obviously public records. There's going to be a second hearing on April 28th because, because it was a public records violation. There will be potentially penalties awarded to CADA for this, so the judges can determine the penalties. But we'll have to see what happens if the Office of Financial Management or the governor decides to appeal. But if that ruling stays into effect, that means going forward in, in future years where the governor negotiates these contracts behind closed doors, we're going to get to be able to see those offers and those counter offers to see, well, what was the starting point? How hard was he fighting for taxpayers? How reasonable or unreasonable were the unions? And arguably, this precedent would apply then to local contracts as well, right? So cities, counties, school districts, police. So it's a big victory for CADF. Congratulations for them taking it on. And we'll just have to see what happens as far as a potential appeal. Thanks. Uh, thanks for leaving, leaving us with something positive, uh, Jason. I, <laughs> I apologize for almost skipping out on that. That is a, that is a great victory. And congratulations to Jackson. I used to work with him uh, when I worked for the state legislature for a period of time. Great guy and a good, good, solid victory for transparency in Washington, Washington state. And congratulations on your part in that. You know, if something good happens, I feel like the Mercier name comes up pretty often. So I'm, I'm glad you have kids because maybe there'll be a gen there'll be a generational uh, doubling of the good news. Uh, with yeah, yeah, I mean, my kids have more luck in court than I have. <laughs> there, there you go. Thanks, Jason. And thanks all of you for watching. We'll be with you next Tuesday for another episode of Washington Policy on the Go. Um, if you missed anything, if there's a section you wanted to see or share, watch for this presentation to be available on our YouTube channel. Um, just check out the Washington Policy Center channel on YouTube and you'll find it there fairly soon. Thanks.